welcome, welcome. If, you yes, by the way, Nazru, just just yeah. want to say a big word of thank you once again for inviting all of us to be here. <laughs> thank it's, you. It's great it's to our pleasure that even you though it's virtual. our pleasure. You have given so much time for Bangladesh Lokama Society. So should I start, Dr. Pong, or we'll have to wait for some yeah. time? For I think we can start. We can start. On behalf of Bangladesh uh, Glaucoma Society, I, I welcome, welcome, you, welcome all. you all uh, in the APCS Symposium. So we have a distinguished speaker in this session, Dr. Shulan Jang, Dr. Ki Ho Park, Dr. Tin Ong, Dr. Selvin Singh, Dr. Clement Tham, and Dr. Tin Rosanna Pong Poon. And let me uh, show my screen. Is it visible? Yes. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank, okay. thank you very much. I am Dr. Nazrul Islam. Uh, with, along with Dr. S. Kafang, I'll be also moderating this session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce the moderator of this session, Dr. Seng Kyung Fang. You know that Dr. Seng Kyung Fang is our leader. He was Secretary General of APGS from his inception, even from the CIAGIG. Currently, he is the President elect of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. He is a senior consultant ophthalmologist and glaucoma specialist at International Specialist Eye Center, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And he's also in the APAO, a chair of Young Ophthalmologist Standing Committee. Let me also introduce Dr. Norman. He is, uh, hopefully he will be joining soon. He is our Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. And he is also head of Glaucoma Section, American Eye Center. He is the Chief of Glaucoma Service. Department of Ophthalmology, University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. Dr. Norman is also Clinical Associate Professor, University of Philippines. So in this stage, I like to request Dr. Seng Kyung Fang to moderate the next session. Can I request Dr. Seng Kyung Fang to introduce the other panelists too? Thank you, Nasru. Uh, I would like to share my screen now. Hopefully, uh, can you all see the, the screen? Yes, we can see. OK, uh, let me start by introducing our uh, distinguished panelists from the Bangladesh uh, Glaucoma Society. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Sheikh uh, Mana. He is a senior consultant and managing director of the Harun I Foundation and Hospital, former head of uh, ophthalmology, uh, Burdam, which uh, stands for Bangladesh uh, Institute of uh, Research in, of Diabetic and Endocrine and Metabolic Diseases. And he's also the past president of the Bangladesh uh, Glaucoma Society. And our second panelist is uh, Professor uh, Muhammad uh, Mizano Rahman, who is a professor and head and the Department of Ophthalmology, Bangladesh Medical College Hospital. He is the present president of the Bangladesh Glaucoma Society and also the president of the ISM SICS uh, Bangladesh uh, chapter. So without further ado, I would like to uh, request uh, the Bangladesh uh, Glaucoma Society current president, Professor Mizanu Rahman for his remarks. Professor Mizano? Yes. <clears throat> is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Sound is okay? Yes, sound is also okay. Loud and clear. Okay. Thanks to Dr. S.K. Pang. And I'm grateful to APGS for give me the opportunity to introduce Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. Bangladesh Glaucoma Society, it was established in 2007 by renowned glaucoma specialist in Bangladesh with the aim to increase the glaucoma awareness and to build up the contact between glaucoma specialist 
to encourage research and services for the development and spreading of knowledge and skill. Now we have 20, uh, 21 executive committee members and we have senior 11 advisors and total life members is 87. What we are doing now, what are the activities of Bangladesh Glaucoma Societies? We are doing EC meeting and CME. EC meeting every two months, we are doing EC meeting and every three months we are conducting the CME in Dhaka and also outside Dhaka. These are the some movements of CME and EC meeting of Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. <laughs> Next conference, every year we are doing on national conference and in the second year we are doing the international conference. This is the inaugural program of first annual national conference of Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. And in the dais, Professor MD Mudassir Ali, our honorable advisor and former advisor of Prime Minister People's Republic of Bangladesh, giving this address. And in the dais, Professor Abba Hussain, President-elect of APAO, late Professor M. Muti, our teacher, Professor Din Muhammad Nurulak, Professor Sheikh M. Mannaf, and APGS board member, Professor M. Nazrul Islam is present in the dais. This is the inaugural program of second international meeting. And uh, also Professor Abha Hussain, Professor Said Mudassir Ali, Professor M. Sharpuddin Ahmed, Professor Sheikh M. Mannaf, and other BGS members and senior ophthalmologists are present here. These are the scientific programs of second international and eighth annual national conference of Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. And you see uh, Dr. Vaisani, that time she was our foreign delegates and she's taking the crest from our advisor, Professor Sheikh M. Mannaf. And in this conference, Dr. Kiyo Park also was present. We are also attending in every two years World Glaucoma Congress with good number of delegates and we are organizing a scientific symposium in the Congress. These are the few moments and scientific program of seven World Glaucoma Congress in Helsinki and eighth World Glaucoma Congress in Melbourne. Now, it's our great pleasure that we attend in Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress that held in Busan, South Korea under the leadership of APGS board member, Professor M. Nazrul Islam, who is now the renowned glaucoma specialist in Bangladesh. <clears throat> and several scientific papers was presented in the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress, Busan. We are celebrating World Glaucoma Week every year in the month of March. These are the some moments of World Glaucoma Week and Day in the year 2019. And during this World Glaucoma Day and Week, Bangladesh Glaucoma Society organizes free glaucoma screening camp, rally, press conference, and discussion meeting for the development of awareness among the people throughout the country. What we have? We have BGS journal. Every year, we are publishing two journal and that journal is a very good quality and this is an index journal. We have official website. Anyone can visit this official website of BGS, www.bgsglaucoma.com. We have official Facebook page of Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. We have BGS in YouTube channel. Our ongoing projects, Bangladesh Glaucoma Survey Protocol. Within a short time, we have started the survey protocol in the country, and that is also approved by the National Ethics Committee. And very soon, we want to start our survey program. And we have also man glaucoma management protocol. Very short time, the protocol will be completed. Our future project, our aim 
established a glaucoma specialized hospital in the country. Thank you for your time, and we are honored to introduce BGS by the kind permission of APGS. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again. Allah Hafiz. Stop share. <clears throat> I think we, we thank uh, the president, Professor Mijanur Rahman, for his introductory speech and showing all the activities of BGS. Now, may I request Dr. Seng Kyung Fang to introduce APGS in front of us and for his own remark. Dr. Fang, please. Thank you, Nasru. Can you all see my slide? Yes, we can see. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I will just take a short uh, time to just introduce uh, Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society to the audience. Uh, our mission statement is to promote excellence in the diagnosis care of glaucoma patients uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific uh, region. I would not go through the details of the, our history and we would just like to join, uh, to encourage everyone to join the APGS mainly because of this uh, uh, educational resources that we have. And uh, these are the members uh, benefit that you can see outlined here. Uh, we have our biannual Congress, but unfor unfortunately uh, we will need to go probably virtual next year. And then uh, we have uh, developed the APGS online education uh, platform, which is now uh, being managed by uh, Professor Tanush Dada. And we have just launched our quarterly newsletter. And I will show you a bit on the online communities. And we also have access uh, to the Journal of Glaucoma and Asian Journal of uh, Ophthalmology. And uh, the rest, I will not go through in detail. Uh, just to show you our online education platform. Uh, this is very new. We have now a video assisted skills transfer. There are a few uh, videos that is being presented there. And uh, thanks to all the APGS uh, members and also uh, some of them uh, have, have very good videos. Uh, for example, you can see here, uh, Chelvin has uh, put up a few videos on uh, MIGS. And also we have uh, our online communities. So we encourage you to join as member. And as a member, you can join all the online communities uh, which is uh, listed here. Uh, for example, angle closure, we have hot topics, we have imaging, and also MIGS. Uh, this is our email address and our website and a QR code. So without further uh, ado, I would like to now uh, start officially our uh, uh, symposium by introducing our first speaker, which is uh, Professor Xiulan Chang, who is a uh, glaucoma specialist and director of clinical uh, research center at the Chongsan Atomic Center in China. And today she will be talking to us on using AI for glaucoma diagnosis. I would like to stop sharing now and over to you, Professor Xiulan Chang. Yeah, Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Professor Nazu Isnan, inviting me here. I would like to share with you using AI for glaucoma diagnosis. My name is Yulan Zhang, I'm from Zhongshan Ophthalmic Center. This is the biggest one and ranking number one eye center in China. I don't have financial disclosure here. And as you all know, glaucoma is a leading cause of irreversible blindness in the world. And diagnosis mainly depending on visual field, OCT, and fundus photo. So a reliable and mature diagnostic platform of glaucoma depending on analysis of multi-modular text, including ASOCT, visual field, retinal fundus photo and the follow-up, uh, long-term follow-up data. So far in glaucoma research field, AI will focus on the diagnosis and prediction. 
for the diagnosis can based on fundus photo, OCT, and visual field. And prediction field can from fundus photo to predict RNF sickness, RNF sickness changes, or their mean deviation. Also came from OCT scan to predict mean deviation or to others. This paper published in the JAMA is using AI to diagnose eye suspected to have corneal optic neuropsy based on fundus photo. And this paper is a uh, Kevin Tan published in Lancet Digital Health is talk about using AI to diagnose R with GON based on the OCT scan. And this paper is uh, based on fundus photo to predict progressive glucomatous optic nerve damage. My project, my team have been doing AI project eye glaucoma based on not only uh, not only in diagnosis, also prediction, including three parts. The first part is AI on chamber angle morphology evaluation. And the second part is on optimal morphology and functional evaluation. And the third part is a building up annotated public data set, trying to promote the uh, glaucoma diagnosis algorithm. Um, let's talk about the uh, uh, optimal morphology and functional evaluation first. And as you all know, visual field is a gold standard to judge disease progression. When you face a visual field report, you can see a lot of information. This is PD plot, uh, represent a black dot, indicating that there's a significant, uh, dec uh, significant decrease in light sensitivity. And PD plot from the uh, PD number, and PD number from the uh, ND number. So we will do in AI, not only the, uh, the single one, but also confuse the, uh, uh, the number to, to do the uh, uh, algorithm. So when you face a glaucoma visual field, it, you can easily to diagnose glaucoma. However, when you face this kind of the pattern, only small uh, black dot, is it glaucoma or non-glaucoma? So we, our purpose is to develop AI algorithm to differentiate glaucoma visual field from non-glaucoma visual field. Also verify the efficacy of deep learning algorithm in visual field classification in multi-center diagnostic trial. We collect 10, more than 10,000 visual field sample from seven different eye centers. Of course, we have a very strict uh, remove criteria. And the uh, data from uh, uh, five eye center and external validation set from another two eye center. From this RC curve, you can see the uh, combined the uh, PD, PDB, NDP, and NDR just mentioned that the confused CNN algorithm uh, have a uh, largest AUC than the uh, hum human. And then we develop a smartphone based on with uh, with smartphone based visual field deep learning system for glaucoma detection and deploy clinical in the real world. And this is the uh, demonstration to show how the uh, APP work. You can see the uh, when you use the uh, APP the APP software in the cell phone scan the uh, PDF PDF. Uh, visual field report, and then you can easily to get the uh, uh, the risk score of the glaucoma diagnosis. It just mentioned the uh, in this case is just mentioned 85, 85 point score for the uh, glaucoma risk. And this project has been finished and published a paper in this year at MPJ Digital Medicine. You can see that Professor Ting Ang also participate this uh, project. And then we uh, will try to combine visual field and OCT uh, to, to build a glaucoma diagnosis and screening platform. Uh, this is iGlaucoma 2.0 a version. Actually already finished this project and writing the paper to, to prepare to submit it. Now let's talk about AI on chamber angle morphology evaluation. 
As you all know, chamber angle evaluation can be varied by gonioscopy, UVN, and ASOCT. And face gonioscopy, you can see OCT have a lot of the advantages than the gonioscopy. Non-contact, fast skin and speed, and provide both cross-sectional and volume scan. And from the ASOCT, you can easily to get a lot of the angle width perimeters, including angle open distance, we call AOD. And also we can get the volumetric perimeter, uh, such as until, until chamber volume ACV. And the volume can be calculated by adding up 128 B scan images. In our pilot study, and actually this one already published, in this scattered proc, you can see there's a gap between the narrow and open angle, either in AOD or the ACV. That means they all have a potential diagnostic uh, ability to detect their angle uh, classification. And this RC curve shows that performance of ACV, the volume, is better than the AOD to detecting the angle uh, width. So, this study indicated that volumetric perimeter is closely associated with angle width and has excellent diagnostic performance. And volumetric scan from OCT is promising to replace gonioscopy in angle width classification. Then we using AI to try to do the uh, to detect the narrow angle subject, and we collect data from the CAS-1 and CAS-2 OCT. And our data came from our Zhongshan Family Center and the external validity set from Singapore uh, National Eye Center. And the other one is from Thailand. So that, and then from the RC curve, you can see either the validity set or external uh, text set. They are 3D, that means a volume, digital gonioscopy system, the algorithm, outer form than the osmologies. And this portrait already finished. And we sub, uh, this is a three country international clinical studies. And we submitted a uh, manuscript already. And you can see Professor Ting on here and the recently also participate this portrait. And in the future, we try to combination until and post your segment image data to construct the glaucoma diagnostic platform that is we call iGlaucoma 3.0. Now let's talk about a little bit how we uh, to do to build up annotated public data set. When you do the uh, AI, everybody will face the data problem. Uh, for example, this is from this photo. Uh, uh, you, you know that a large CD ratio is a considered as a risk factor of a glaucoma. However, there's no large fine annotation data set for the fundus vocal uh, data. So we manually annotated the disc, cup, and foveal uh, from the seven independent glaucoma specialists. That means one photo uh, seven annotate annotation. Then the data set is more accurate. And this data set has been published in the uh, uh, Mikai 2018. Mikai is a top conference in the uh, imaging field. And then we keep continue to do the data set. It's AMD and the uh, uh, highly myopia data set. And last year, we uh, uh, published the uh, AGE data set based on the ASOCT uh, for the angle culture. And this year, we also published the uh, second time, uh, second round of the uh, founders photo data set. And we searched in the net, there are 10, there are 10 uh, fine annotation data set in the world, our team already contributed five data set. So based on the data set, we are published two uh, paper in the medical imaging analysis. This is a top journal of the image field. This one is based on founders photo. 
And this one is based on ASOST and published this year. So in the future, when people still fussy how to diagnose the early diagnosis glaucoma, that AI robot already say yes, yes, glaucoma. So AI will sharply improve glaucoma diagnosis and prediction. And multimodular imaging data could be used in AI study. And development of AI algorithm heavily depending on high quality data. And AI algorithm based on multi-modular data will be the future trend in medical diagnosis and prediction. And AI-based glaucoma diagnosis and decision-making platform will be constructed in the future. The future belongs to AI and big data. I would like to thank you my iGlaucoma Cooperation Research Group, which are from Chinese Academy of Science, Yan Wuxi from Baidu and Ming Kui Tan from South China University of Technology and Ting Ong and Daniel Tim from Singapore National Eye Center. This is my team. So thank you very much. Thank you, Zulan. Uh, can you unshare your screen? And uh, I would like to invite uh, Tin, Tin Ong. Can you uh, give a one minute uh, comment on uh, Zulan's uh, presentation? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Zhang for her excellent talk on AI for glaucoma diagnosis. And Professor Chang has given an overview of the different use of AI, starting with fundus photographs, and then uh, visual field interpretation, and also uh, angle uh, images on anterior segment imaging. And finally, a combination of the different uh, data sets to help the glaucoma uh, diagnosis. So I think it's a very important area because uh, many ophthalmologists may not know how to interpret such um, you know, uh, images from, especially if they're, they're not a glaucoma specialist. So these such tools will be very useful for general ophthalmologists to help interpret the glaucoma diagnosis in their patients. I think in the future, it's going to be uh, mainstream and we will use it as a first, like, like a first screen or to help diagnose glaucoma. And then subsequently, uh, ophthalmologists will then look in more detail, especially for the images for photo fundus photographs. And of course, in the future, we also want to be able to use AI to predict who will get worsening glaucoma or who will get severe glaucoma. Thank you so much, uh, Tulan. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fang. Can I introduce next speaker? Yes, please. Uh, okay, okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Ki Ho Park. I think uh, uh, Bangladesh ophthalmologists know him because he's so sober, so gentle. He came to Bangladesh and people really appreciated his presentation many times. So it's our opportunity, it's our proud that he's come to again to our conference. Uh, Professor Park is the president of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society now. He's working in the Seoul National University as Professor of Ophthalmology. He's also currently the president of the Korean Ophthalmological Society. And Dr. Park is going to talk on updates on glaucoma imaging. Uh, over to you, Dr. Park. I think your presentation is in video. The video will be run now. Good afternoon. I'm Kiho Park at Seoul National University. What I'm going to share with you is about updates on glaucoma imaging. I have no financial interest related with my talk. Glaucoma is known as the leading cause of blindness worldwide. In glaucoma, the optic nerve is damaged with loss of retinal ganglion cells and their axons. And there is characteristic loss of visual field, which corresponds with the structural damage. This is the figure by Dr. Medeiros' paper. As you can see, the change in visual field is slow in the early stage of glaucoma, which we call it as the ceiling effect. In contrast, the change in RNFL thickness is relatively faster than that in visual field in early stage and very slow in the advanced stage, which we call it as the floor effect. However, as you can see in this figure, the floor effect starts in the very late stage of the advanced glaucoma. So even in most part of the advanced glaucoma, 
the RNFL thickness can play a role to detect glaucoma progression. This is a case of a lady in which the disc hemorrhage was detected by chance in the routine health checkup in 2009. Fortunately, she had her previous fundus photograph of 2006, which showed no definite abnormality. Her intraocular pressure was 16 millimeters of mercury. She was followed up for more than 13 years. Two episodes of recurrent disc hemorrhages were detected in 2002 and 2016 in the inferotemporal neuroretinal rim. You can find the RNFL defect has developed later and progressed in the region of disc hemorrhage. The visual fields by standard automated perimetry were within normal limits until 2016, while the RNFL and GCIPL loss has been already detected in 2012 and then continuously progressed. Conventionally and fundamentally, we have been re relying on the visual field examination and the optic nerve head and peripapillary RNFL examination. But why not emphasizing the macular region where more than 50% of whole retinal ganglion cells are concentrated in? The ganglion cell complex is composed of no fiber layer, ganglion cell layer, and inner plex form layer. The ganglion cell layer corresponds to the cell body of the retinal ganglion cells, and the inner plex form layer corresponds to the dendrite of the retinal ganglion cells. The no fiber layer is composed of the axons of the retinal ganglion cells. Normally, in healthy eyes, the GCIPL thickness map showed donut shaped symmetric appearance as shown in the right eye. If there is a glaucomatous defect in the ganglion cell layer, this, asymmet this symmetrical pattern is broken. We know that in glaucoma, the visual field defect is asymmetrical across the horizontal raphe, as you can see in the glaucoma hemifield test. Similarly, the same principle can be applied to the GCIPL thickness. The right-hand side figure is showing the custom software developed to perform GCIPL hemifield test to, det to detect glaucoma. The healthy eye in the first row showed normal GCIPL hemifield test. In preperimetric glaucoma with very early inferotemporal RNFL defect in the second row case, showed asymmetrical GCIPL loss in the corresponding region with the outside normal limits result. In the early glaucoma case, in the third row showed RNFL defect with visual field loss and abnormal GCIPL hemifield test. GCIPL hemifield test can be applied to the glaucoma diagnosis in highly myopic eyes. As the peripapillary RNFL map may show artifacts such as red disease, and the RNFL photograph may not clearly show the RNFL defect. This GCIPL thickness map finding may be helpful in highly myopic eyes. When we integrate peripapillary RNFL map with the macular GCIPL map, we can get more information in glaucoma progression. In this case, GCIPL change was detected earlier than RNFL change. This is an opposite case where the RNFL change was detected earlier than the, the GCIPL change. Temporal relation between macular GCIPL loss and peripapillary RNFL loss in glaucoma has been studied. After three-year follow-up of 94 eyes with GCIPL loss, corresponding RNFL loss was detected in about 20% of cases. In contrast, after three-year follow-up of 52 eyes without GCIPL loss, 
RNFL defect was appeared only in about 2%, which means that GCIPL change appears first in most cases of POHIs in Korea. Recently, the researchers in Australia has shown that the GCIPL loss is detected earlier than RNFL loss in normal tension glaucoma group compared to the high tension group, which is quite similar to our Korean patients' results where normal tension glaucoma is predominant in the population. This is another case in which the RNFL loss might have been missed with the conventional SDOCT scan as shown in the upper figures because the defect is located outside the GCIPL analysis. However, the wide field analysis by SWEP source OCT could detect the defect, as you can see in the lower figures. I'm going to introduce a probability deviation map developed by Professor Don Hood at Columbia University. Using SWEP source OCT, wide field scan is performed including both macula and disc. Then, visual field test points were overlaid by the flipped RNFL and GCIPL thickness significance map called super pixel map. This map can assist in detecting the probability of future glaucoma progression in the patient's visual field. This is a 69-year-old gentleman with early glaucoma showing inferotemporal RNFL defect. The RNFL thickness and GCIPL thickness probability maps were overlaid on the visual field. Even though the case was pre-perimetric glaucoma and having a normal visual field, the suspicious points with decreased sensitivity exactly match with the structural defect in the probability maps. This is a 59-year-old gentleman with pre-perimetric glaucoma showing superotemporal and inferotemporal RNFL defects. Even though the visual field was within normal limits in 24-2 standard automated perimetry, the suspicious points were within the structural defects by probability map. An even more interesting finding was that after analyzing 43 cases of pre-perimetric glaucomas, the probability map could predict the future visual field progression in these eyes. These are the take-home messages. Macular GCIPL thickness map can be a useful tool to detect early glaucoma. In early glaucoma, Macular GCIPL defect is frequently detected before corresponding RNFL defect, especially in normal tension glaucoma. Wide field scan can detect the structural defect, which might have been missed by conventional RNFL or macular GCIPL analysis. The structural changes on the swept source OCT probability maps could detect or predict the visual field changes in pre-perimetric glaucoma eyes. I'd like to thank all the participants who contributed to our research. Further, I'd like to thank Professor Nazrul Islam and Bangladesh Glaucoma Society for kind invitation to this symposium. These photos were taken five years ago at the sixth annual conference of Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Iho Park. Uh, it, is a, it was a brilliant presentation as always. We have learned so many things from your presentation and definitely glaucoma imaging is very important now. As you already mentioned, for the early diagnosis of glaucoma, we need to do the amazing, especially the GCIPL. We find many times that RNFL is normal, but GCIPL is going to be thinner. So definitely for the early diagnosis, we need to do it. Thank you very much. 
Now, may I request Dr. Shivlan Zhang to have a brief comment on the presentation? Dr. Zhang, please. <laughs> unmute, please, Dr. Zhang, unmute. What happened? Is me? <laughs> yeah. For what? <laughs> You want me to do what? <laughs> and, uh, you have a comment on the presentation of uh, Professor Kihopa. Oh, uh, I, I think Professor Kihopa do a great job. And because my team also involved in a procurement image field too. Uh, I I already prepared some questions. I want to ask him after after this, uh, uh, this session. Can we? Can I? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so I'm. I like to thank uh, Professor Kihopar for the photograph we have shown from Bangladesh Glaucoma Society five six years before. Thank yeah, you so much. And Dr. The... Preen Rosanna Pangpon already in. Uh, welcome. A great welcome, Dr. Preen, to you, because we are waiting for you for a long time. Thank you very much for ultimately joining uh, with a good pass. Thank you very much. So only normal is left. I probably he is not able to join. So now I request Dr. Fang to continue. Unmute, please, Dr. Fang, unmute. Thank you, Nazaro. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Tin Ong. Let me share my screen. Yeah, can you see? Professor Tin On is a Deputy Medical Director, Singapore National Eye Center, and he's also the Executive Director of Singapore Eye Research Institute and Professor of the Yong Lu Ling School of Medicine and National University of Singapore. And he's a past president of the World Glaucoma Association. Today he'll be talking to us, should we do laser iridotomy for primary angle closure suspect? Over to you, uh, Tin. Thank you so much, um, Seng Kiong, and thank you, uh, Nasru, for inviting us to present at your meeting. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we can see. Thank you. So my talk today is on management of uh, asymptomatic angle closure suspects, whether we should do a laser iridotomy. I have no disclosures. So we are discussing now angle closure glaucoma. As you know, it's an important form of glaucoma worldwide, especially in our region, it affects more than 20 million people. The prevalence of angle closure glaucoma in most Asian populations is between one to 2%. However, as much as five to 8% of the general population have narrow angles or primary angle closure suspects. In China, it's up around 8%. So from these figures alone, you can see that most of angle closure suspects do not progress to angle closure glaucoma. In the old days, the suspected uh, conversion or progression rate was as high, estimated to be as high as 30% of in within five years from PSCS to PAC, and between 10 to 30% from PSC to PACG. But this was based on a Velo eye study, which was, which was one of the few studies who did a prospective follow-up. Let me discuss a patient with you, which is a common example of a angle closure suspect. 59-year-old woman who has no symptoms. She has hyperopia of plus two, good vision, 6-6 six, six in both eyes, some a bit of shallow anterior chamber, very minimal cataract. Her pressures are normal. She has normal optic disc and visual fields, but gonioscopy shows close angles in both eyes, but no peripheral anterior sanicare. And this is the example of the anterior segment OCT showing a positional of the iris to the angle. So this is a patient uh, who has asymptomatic angle closure suspects and with minimal cataract and normal optic disc and visual fields. So how will you manage this patient? The options are to do a laser iridotomy in both eyes, pilocarpine in both eyes, bilateral phaco emulsification, or observation. And most of you will probably choose either a laser iridotomy in both eyes or observation. And remember, this patient has no cataract and six, six vision. Of course, if you tell the patient, we can observe you, 
you worry about being sued because this lady may develop acute angle closure next month or may come back one year later with chronic angle closure glaucoma. So we always worry about such cases. If we tell the patient, we can observe you and the patient comes back with severe disease. Of course, iridotomy is commonly performed for angle closure because it relieves pupil block. As you can see in this example, after iridotomy, the iris convexity in pupil block reverses and the angle opens up. And laser iridotomy is relatively a safe procedure, but there are some side effects, particularly patients may have visual symptoms. There could be corneal endothelial damage and some people may get progression of cataract. So how should you counsel your patients who have PACS regarding LPI? What are the risks versus benefit? And what is the risk of observation versus doing a laser iridotomy? And this is the reason for considering these uh, questions is because the economic burden of treating all PACS in the population is very high. For example, in China, if five to 8% of people above the age of 50 have PACS, should we screen all these people for angle closure and offer them LPI? This is a huge economic cost. And so I'd like to introduce the Zongshan Angle Closure Prevention Trial or the ZAP study. ZAP stands for Zongshan Angle Closure Prevention. And this study was published in 2019 in the Lancet. And the question of this trial was how we should manage asymptomatic narrow angles or PACS. Basically in this trial, they recruited patients with bilateral PACS and followed them up for six years. And all patients were randomized to undergo LPI in one eye and no treatment or observation in the other eye. And this was a prospective randomized control trial. And patients were followed up on a regular interval. And the main outcome measure was the incidence of primary angle closure or PAC defined as IOP more than 24 on two separate occasions or the development of peripheral anterior sinicare or an episode of acute angle closure. And in this study, the mean age of participants was 59 years and majority were female and most of the iridotomies were performed in the superior part of the iris. And the mean follow-up was similar in both the iridotomy versus and the un untreated group. And overall, they had 75% completed the study successfully. And overall, in this results, they found that in the laser iodotomy treated eyes, the cumulative incidence of PAC was 4.9 per thousand eye years, compared to almost double 7.97 per thousand eye years in the untreated eye. And the primary outcome was occurred in both eyes in 10 participants. Looking at the raw numbers, this translates to about 2% of progression in the LPI group versus 4% in the untreated group. The ZAP trial found that the risk factors for progression were eyes with narrow angle width at baseline, but however, intraocular pressure and dark room perforative tests were not associated with reaching an endpoint. So this study was very surprising in that the overall progression rate over six years was very low, less than 1% per year. Of course, if you did iodotomy, the risk of progression reduced by about half. And the study found that laser iodotomy was safe with no long-term adverse events. Remember, the endpoint was not PACG, but the conversion to PAC. And people could argue that PAC itself is not visually significant or damaging because there's no glaucomatous optic nerve damage. And so the study shows that the risk of observation alone was quite low in the sense that the very few people actually progress to PAC. And certainly in a programmatic level or the population level, we do not re recommend screening followed by laser iodotomy in a large segment of the population. The Zetra, of course, were uh, mostly Chinese participants. And so we do not know the risk in other populations. The population was slightly younger in the sense that their mean age was only 59. And this was because intentionally we wanted to recruit patients who did not have significant cataract. All those patients who are older will have significant cataract and these patients would, should then undergo cataract surgery. 
And finally, the ZEP trial recruited patients from the community setting in Guangzhou. And so this could be at slightly lower risk. Let me share your now the results of a similar trial in Singapore called the Analyst Trial or the Asymptomatic Narrow Angles Laser Iodotomy Trial. And we used the same protocol as the ZEP study. In fact, actually the ZEP study used the Singapore protocol, except that they recruited patients much quicker than us. And although we started at about the same time, we took more than three years to recruit our patients, whereas the Guangzhou study recruited all the patients within six months. And our follow-up was slightly shorter, only five years, and our target sample size was only 480 patients. And the Singapore study was just recently analyzed, and we found that uh, without intervention, 9.5% of PACS progressed to PAC, and 5% progressed for those with laser iodotomy. So again, the risk of iodotomy reduced, the, the iodotomy reduced the risk of progression by half. And our progression rates were slightly higher than ZAP, which showed 4% uh, and 2% respectively. The majority of those who progressed developed PAC, but we only had three patients who developed an acute attack. In the Singapore study, the risk factors for progression were narrow angles at baseline, as, as in ZAP, higher baseline IOP, higher post-dilation IOP, and patients with diabetes mellitus. So if you look at the two studies together, you can see that the progression rates for ZAP was 4% compared to 9% in Singapore, and for the, un, for the treated eyes, 2% in ZAP versus 5% in Singapore. And why the difference between the two trials? Well, we don't know for sure, but one possibility is because the Singapore study recruited patients from a hospital setting. The mean ang angle width was slightly wider in the Gongzhou trial. And secondly, and thirdly, there could be some racial differences because in the Singapore trial, we did recruit some patients who were non-Chinese. But overall, both studies shows a very low risk of progression for PACS if you are untreated. And remember, the end point was PAC and not PACG. And this raises the question of whether we are over-treating patients with PACS by offering them laser iodotomy in all patients. And so when I see a patient now with PACS, I will discuss with the patient the option of laser iodotomy versus observation. I will quote the data from the trials and say that they would have a risk of progression of up to 10% if they don't do anything, and doing the laser iodotomy will reduce the risk by half. And I'll explain the risk of both page options and let the patient decide what they, should, what they want to do. And if the patient is in doubt or the patient asks me to decide, I will usually go towards laser iodotomy because some patients may not understand. Of course, with older patients with cataract, you don't have to offer a laser iodotomy. You just do a phaco emulsification. As you know, lens extraction will also remove the pupil block element and open up the lens, uh, open up the angles. And here's a patient of PACS who had significant cataract, and after cataract surgery, the angle opened up significantly. So who should go for laser iodotomy? Of course, patients who have PAC, PACG, acute angle closure, and fellow eyes of acute angle closure should definitely go for laser iodotomy. But among the PACS, I would recommend laser iodotomy for those who are symptomatic or sounds like they could have the intermittent symptoms. Patients who need regular dilation, for example, those who have diabetes or macular degeneration. Patients who have poor access or follow-up. Possibly patients with a family history of angle closure glaucoma should also be considered for laser iodotomy. And of course, this is based on Singapore and Chinese population, and this, you, this data may vary in your population. So in summary, the current <laughs> for the management of PACS, I shared with you today data from two trials. One was the ZEP trial from China, and the second was the analyst trial from Singapore. Both studies showed a low risk of progression for observation, and this raises the option of observation for patients with PACS. And the, without doing anything, the risk of progression was about 4% in the ZEP trial and about 9.5% in the Singapore trial. So discuss the risk of this uh, observation with patients, and if in doubt, do the laser iodotomy. For patients with PACS with cataract, of course, I recommend removing the cataract. I'd like to acknowledge 
the list of uh, research fellows on the left who worked on the trial, as well as my international collaborators, Ming Guang He, David Friedman, and Paul Foster, and the Singapore collaborators, Paul Chu from NUH and Wong Huang Tim from Dan Tok Seng, as well as my SNC collaborators who helped recruit patients for the analyst trial. And acknowledgement, I'd like to acknowledge funding from the National Medical Research Council of Singapore. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Tin, for a good uh, overview of the indications of uh, P, uh, uh, laser PI for PACS. Uh, I would like now to ask uh, Clement maybe to give one minute uh, comment on Tin's uh, presentation. Clement? Yes, thanks very much, San Kyung. And also, my special thanks to Tin for presenting a very clear lecture based on very solid scientific evidence from true trials. And he has also given us a very good, comprehensive discussion of this issue. Maybe allow me to just bring in a, 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 another perspective using the number needed to treat concept, NNT. This is basically the number that you need to treat a particular condition in order to prevent one adverse outcome from this condition. Um, for the number needed to treat for PACS to prevent a progression to PAC, the number is five, okay? It's roughly around five. And let me try to put this into perspective. In, in fact, generally, a number needed to treat of about six is considered a good NNT for many interventions, assuming that the treatment has minimal risk and that the outcome is something really serious, like, for example, blindness. And to put things into perspective, the number needed to treat for treatment of systemic hypertension with the aim of preventing death, stroke, or MI is around three. And so this is something very worth treating. Whereas the number needed to treat for the treatment of all cases of ocular hypertension with the aim of preventing early structural changes of visual field defect is 20. And that's the reason why we do not normally treat all cases of OHT. Now, to, to put things into further perspective for PAC, I would also have to mention that we are only preventing it from progressing to PACS and not really preventing blindness. And, and also, uh, PA, uh, uh, sorry, preventing progression to PAC and not preventing blindness. And PAC is generally, by definition, not associated with functional loss. And even when it has progressed to PAC, it is usually takes many years before it progressed to PACG, which is a disease with a functional loss. So with this extra perspective, I, I think I generally very much support the conclusions uh, drawn by uh, Professor Tin Ong. Thanks very much for allowing me to comment. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clement Tham and Professor Tin Ong for beautiful presentation and discussion. So with permission, now can I go to the next speaker? It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Shelvin Sheikh. She is the Associate Professor in National University Hospital, Singapore. Dr. Sheng is also convener of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society and Mixed Interest Group. She is adjunct clinical investigator in Singapore Eye Research Institute. And she is also co-investigator of Paul Glaucoma Implant. Uh, can I request Dr. Selvin Singh to start presentation? She has a recorded presentation. I think uh, now we'll watch her presentation. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the Asia Pacific Lacoma Society for this invitation to speak on the evolution of NICS. These are my financial disclosures. Evolution is the change in the population's characteristics over time, and the process of evolution involves speciation, diversification, natural selection, and survival of the fittest. Mix is very much an evolution of glaucoma surgery, and MIX itself has also evolved with time. The evolution of MIX has pretty much followed these same milestones. Let us first look at speciation, which is the process by which populations evolve to become distinct species. Though devices such as the trabectome were available since 2005, the term MIX or microinvasive glaucoma surgery only came about in 2009, when it was coined by the mixed guru himself, Ike Ahmed. He recognized that this was a new generation of procedures that was clearly different from conventional glaucoma surgery, with different indications 
and characteristics. Mix was first defined by these characteristics, a high safety profile, minimal trauma, app internal approach, ease of use, and rapid recovery. Due to the high safety profile of mixed devices, they could be offered to patients with mild to moderate glaucoma, hence reducing medication burden and hopefully improving the quality of life. This led to the concept of interventional glaucoma, advocating for earlier surgical intervention with these safe glaucoma devices. In particular, MIX had a role as a phacoplast procedure. Cataract surgery provided a unique opportunity to have MIX devices implanted at the same time, without significantly increasing surgical risks, hence effectively killing two birds with one stone. And the first generation eye stand was arguably the pioneer mix device, which inspired this entire genre of glaucoma surgery. One year results of the pivotal RCT comparing combined FACO eye stand with FACO alone showed that the combined procedure was more effective in lowering the IOP and had a higher success rate. With the success of the eye stand, more and more devices wanted to jump onto the mixed bandwagon, resulting in diversification. To accommodate these other devices, the definition of mix started to evolve, with the definition becoming broader, to include devices which had a higher safety profile and less trauma than conventional glaucoma surgery, but certainly permitting more complications and invasiveness compared to the initial definition. And other traits, such as the app internal approach, are seen as not absolutely essential. And this broader definition was used in the FDA mix workshop to include a diverse group of alternative glaucoma surgeries intended to be safer and induce considerably less tissue disruption than traditional procedures. As a consequence, all these devices now fall under the mixed umbrella, though some of them may not adhere to the original definition of mix. The first generation eye stand has evolved into the second generation eye stand inject, which is easier to implant with a shorter learning curve. The eye stand inject has two stands in one injector allowing the surgeon to target more of the trabecular meshwork and outflow channels compared to the first generation eye stand. There is further diversification within the trabecular bypass devices with the introduction of the Hydris microstent, which is a larger device which not only bypasses the trabecular meshwork, but also acts as a scaffold to hold Schlem's canal open. An RCT comparing the hydras with two first-generation eye stents showed that the hydras resulted in fewer medications and was associated with a higher complete success rate. If well positioned, the trabecular bypass devices increase outflow to the aqueous veins, and our preliminary results show that this results in a reduction in signal on OCT angiography. Supracoroidal devices were introduced, such as the ill-fated Cypass microstent and also the eye stand supra and the mini-jet. Six months results of the mini-jet are promising, showing a significant reduction in IOP and the number of medications. Subconjunctival mixed devices have further increased our surgical repertoire. The Zen implant is inserted app internal, while the Preserflow microshunt is implanted app external. Both devices protect against hypotony and are potentially capable of achieving lower IOP compared with trabecular bypass devices, but have blood related complications. One year results of an RCT comparing the microshunt with trabeclectomy showed that traps still resulted in lower IOP 
but had a higher incidence of complications. 0.2 mg per mil MMC was used in this study, and increasing the concentration of MMC may also increase the efficacy of the microshunt. We now have good quality long-term RCT data on most of the mixed devices, but these are mainly for POAG patients. The indications of mix are also starting to diversify beyond POAG, and early pilot data for mix in the context of other glaucoma subtypes have emerged. This RCT comparing FACO alone with combined FACO eye stent in angle closure eyes showed that the combined procedure resulted in a higher complete success rate. But of course, iris occlusion of the mixed device can occur in angle closure eyes. Small pilot studies on the use of mix in other glaucoma subtypes, for example, uveitic and neovascular glaucoma, have been conducted, but the data are limited and this requires further investigation. Of course, in any evolutionary process, natural selection goes hand in hand with diversification. The Cypass microstance was the first victim of this and was withdrawn in August 2018 due to the finding of increased endothelial cell loss at five years compared with controls. There have also been reports of blab-related complications associated with the Zen implant. And indeed, as highlighted by our BJO editorial, these findings signal the coming of age of mix. The detractors of mix may say that the safety profile of certain mix devices has fallen short of what was initially promised. But the proponents of mix will highlight that with newer subconjunctival mix devices, the efficacy of mix is exceeding expectations and may have a role in more advanced glaucoma. And the most important take-home message is that context matters. It's all about balancing the risk of losing vision from glaucoma with the risk of losing vision from surgical complications. In mild glaucoma, the risk of losing vision from surgical complications takes precedence and trabecular bypass procedures are more appropriate. In advanced glaucoma, the risk of losing vision from glaucoma becomes more important and more invasive surgery, for example, subconjunctival mix or conventional glaucoma surgery should be considered. Unlike the Cypass, the Zen implant has emerged relatively unscathed from the reports of blood-related infections because the Zen is indicated for medically uncontrolled glaucoma and refractory glaucoma. On the other hand, the Cypass was redrawn because it was indicated for patients with mild to moderate glaucoma, hence the tolerance of complications is low in this context. Ultimately, Survival of the fittest applies in the mixed world just like it does in the law of nature. The future and survival of a mixed device lies in how well it can navigate the global landscape and achieve globalization. The cost effectiveness of each mixed device would need to be examined in the context of different reimbursement environments. The out-of-pocket reimbursement environment in most Asian countries means that reducing the price of these devices in exchange for an increase in sales volume may chart a more profitable path in the long run. Adequate surgical training to ensure consistently good and reproducible outcomes is also crucial in ensuring the survival of mixed devices in the global context. The evolution of mix is still a work in progress. After undergoing speciation, diversification, and natural selection, the world now waits with bated breath to see which mix devices will survive.
But in any evolutionary process, we can always rest assured that we're moving towards a superior, much improved version of the future. And I'm grateful that the APGS community is constantly striving towards a better future for our glaucoma patients in the Asia Pacific region. I'd like to invite you to visit our APGS Mix website and do look out for our open access mix book, which will be published very shortly. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Selvin Singh. You have done a great presentation of three, four hours, but it completed in 12 minutes. Great, great presentation. And actually it has given so much beautiful description of the evolution of mix. And there are many questions already you answered in your presentation, the cost. Because in our part, we have said many times, mild to moderate glaucoma mix. But unfortunately, in our part, we don't have mild to moderate glaucoma. We have advanced glaucoma, most of our cases. So really, mix is a really a dream for us because we don't have mild to moderate glaucoma and cost. Already you mentioned, if we can use many, many mix, definitely cost will come down. And as you are in the link between the developed country and developing country, you are in the APGS. Uh, MIGS person, convener. So I think you can help us. Which MIGS will be better for which country? Thank you so much mm -hmm. for the presentation. Now, can I request Dr. Preen Rosano Pangpun, who is also a mix master, uh, would you please comment on the presentation? Uh, Dr. Preen? Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I, I run between. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I think I think uh, I have no doubt that mix is will be a great part. You know, it's it's the mindset problem. It's like everything, like investment. You have to if you need a very good return, you need a high risk, and that is filtering surgery. But sometimes, if safety is more an issue, since more important uh, than. Uh, I think mix is, is, can be used in many cases. And most of the time, I think it's the mindset of the doctor that, you know, do not really uh, offer the alternative, the choices to the patient. Because if we modify the technique and we could save so many patients from many complications from a standard filtering surgery like tabeculectomy. So I think uh, mix, we'll see mix coming up and, and it will be a great uh, um, treatment armamentarium in our glaucoma practice. And cause is sometimes is, is the mindset of doctor, but it's not for the patient. Thank you, thank you. We'll not be behind. We'll also use mix in near future. Professor Frank, please. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you, Nas. Uh, thank you, Nasro. Thank you, Chauvin. Uh, I'd like now to uh, introduce uh, Professor Clement Tam, who is. Uh... Yeah, sorry. Uh, he's the vice president of the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society and the chairman of the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, he will be talking to us on lens, lens extraction in primary angle closure. Uh, on to you, Clement. Thank you, Sang Kyung. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by first thanking the Bangladesh Glaucoma Society, in particular, Professor Rahman and also Professor Islam for inviting the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society uh, to join the conference this year. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, in my short talk today, I'll be covering lens extraction in primary angle closure. Uh, these are my financial disclosures and also the funding that has gone into supporting our work on PACG. Now, I'll divide my talk into two parts. First, I'll talk about the applications of lens extraction in primary angle closure glaucoma. And then secondly, I'll talk about uh, its use in acute primary angle closure. Now, of course, we are fully aware nowadays that by removing the lens, we can significantly increase the anterior chamber depth widen the drainage angle and reverse much of the anatomical predisposition to angle closure. 
Now, let me share with you a, a, a possible algorithm for deciding what to do in each case of primary angle closure disease. I will share with you two hypothetical situations. In this first slide here, I'll show you the hypothetical situation when there is a 360 degrees complete appositional angle closure. Under this situation, if you can do something to reverse the anatomical predisposition to angle closure, then chances are that the aqueous can access the trabecular meshwork and perhaps some aqueous drainage or even normal aqueous drainage may be re-established. In this situation, if there is visually significant cataract, then you may consider cataract extraction. If there is still persistent appositional angle closure with plateau iris syndrome after the cataract extraction, then perhaps you may consider argon laser peripheral iridoplasty. On the other hand, if there is no visually significant cataract here, then perhaps you may start with laser peripheral iridotomy. But if there is still persistent appositional angle closure with ocular hypertension afterwards, then you will have to decide whether plateau iris configuration or the lens being the main mechanism. And then you treat these mechanisms accordingly. In other words, we are aiming for a management algorithm that is based on the nature and also the, the extent of angle closure. Now in this second scenario here, we have a hypothetical 360 degrees complete synechial angle closure. In this situation, if you merely do something to widen the drainage angle, chances are that the trabecular meshwork will still be closed off by the peripheral anterior synechii and aqueous drainage may not be uh, easily reestablished. So in this situation, uh, you may need to consider some additional procedure to lower the intraocular pressure. So once again, if you've got visually significant cataract and perhaps cataract extraction is first on your list, plus or minus one other IOP lowering surgery. And this can be in the form of goniosyniculysis, some form of cyclophotocoagulation, perhaps mix or combining the phaco with trabeculectomy or even with glaucoma drainage device implantation. Whereas on the other hand, if there's no visually significant cataract, then you would have to decide whether the lens mechanism predominates. If that is the case, after care, very detailed discussion with the patients of the pros and cons, you may consider clear lens extraction with or without another intraocular pressure lowering surgery. But on the other hand, if you feel that the lens is not a predominating mechanism, then you'll probably proceed with one of these lists of a IOP lowering surgery. Now, how do we know whether the lens is the main contributing mechanism? I think. Uh, in clinical practice, probably the two most important parameters would be a qualitative assessment of the central anterior chamber depth, as well as looking for this, what I would call the Mount Fujiyama sign. Now, first of all, uh, there, there are of course other quantitative measures that at least for the time being, they are more useful for uh, re research studies uh, than in daily clinical practice. But at some point, I think they, will be, they may find use in the daily clinical practice as well. Amongst these two signs, personally, I feel that the central anterior chamber depth is the most important because this is a combined effect of both the lens thickness as well as the anterior posterior position of the lens. Now, these photos here show you when you're looking sideways using a gonioscopic lens uh, at, uh, at the uh, anterior chamber of the eye with a very prominent and anteriorly positioned lens. In fact, the uh, configuration of the iris looks very much like Mount Fujiyama. In, in other words, it looks like a volcano, especially when the pupil is in a more constricted state. This is because of the very prominent and anteriorly positioned lens with the iris being draped over the anterior surface of this lens. Now, when you remove the lens in cases of primary angle closure glaucoma, I can share with you this uh, trial that we published earlier this year in the Journal of Glaucoma, when we're looking at the long-term outcomes of phaco emulsification versus combined phaco trabeculectomy in primary angle closure glaucoma eyes with coexisting cataract. You can see that the solid line representing those cases receiving cataract extraction alone, there's a quite a significant intraocular pressure drop 
after surgery, immediately after surgery, and this effect is well maintained over the course of at least six years after surgery. But then, of course, in the dotted line, when you combine the cataract extraction with trabeculectomy, you do get a persistently lower intraocular pressure com compared to the uh, phaco emulsification alone group. But of course, this is associated with uh, some additional complications along the way. Now, so in the phaco emulsification group, over the course of six years of follow-up, about 10 patients or around 20% of the patients actually required trabeculectomy during the follow-up period at a mean time of about two and a half years after the initial surgery. But none of the combined phaco trabeculectomy cases required any additional filtration surgery. Now, just now we were looking at the scenario when there was cataract, and so it's much easier decision to proceed with cataract extraction with or without other uh, combined procedures. But what about when there is no visually significant cataract? This is the, a summary of the clinical outcomes of a randomized controlled trial that we conducted earlier on uh, uncontrolled cases of PACG without cataract. And these eyes were randomized into receiving either phacal emulsification alone, which is represented by the blue line, as compared to trabeculectomy alone, which is represented by the red line. You can see that even in these eyes, just by performing the phacal emulsification, there's a very nice intraocular pressure drop immediately after surgery that is maintained for at least two years after surgery. Of course, with trabeculectomy, there's a greater IOP reduction, at least initially, but you can see that by about one year, from about one year onwards after surgery, the two lines really come together. Now, of course, when we are talking about um, uh, lens extraction and, and ir iridotomy, we, we cannot forget the EGO study, which is the effectiveness of early lens extraction for the treatment of PACG, a randomized controlled trial published in the Lancet, uh, it's four years ago now, so time really flies. In this study, over 400 patients were recruited, including both PAC and PACGIs, and they were randomized into receiving either clear lens extraction or laser peripheral iridotomy. And these are all uh, uh, newly diagnosed patients. And um, it, to cut a long story short, in the interest of time, the conclusion from this study was that clear lens extraction showed greater efficacy and was more cost effective than laser peripheral iridotomy and should, should be considered as an option for first line treatment. Now next, I'll be talking about the application of lens extraction in acute primary angle closure. In the management of acute primary angle closure, we can consider it as having two different stages of treatment. In the first stage of treatment, we aim to reduce the intraocular pressure and the symptoms as quickly as possible. Whereas in the second stage of treatment, we aim to prevent a recurrence of the acute primary angle closure and also to prevent the progression to PACG. Traditionally, this has been achieved with laser peripheral iridotomy, but perhaps early lens extraction can also be one possible option. Now, this is a randomized controlled trial that we conducted in Hong Kong. By randomizing acute primary angle closure cases into receiving either early phaco emulsification or laser iridotomy. You can see that by a mean follow-up of 18 months after the initial uh, acute attack, the proportion of eyes that had high, higher intraocular pressure than 21 was significantly higher in those eyes treated with laser iridotomy. Furthermore, in the group treated by laser iridotomy, the, the mean number of medications by the end of follow-up was also significantly higher. So the conclusion from this study is that after aborting uh, acute primary angle closure, lens extraction may serve to reduce PAS formation and progression to PACG and may be a very useful and safe stage two intervention. And you may also perhaps consider combining this with cineculysis, whether the gonio type or the visco type. So nowadays with uh, these studies and data in mind, our approach for acute primary angle closure is first of all, a stage one treatment. We lower the intraocular pressure and relieve the symptoms promptly by immediate laser peripheral iridoplasty, which can be done with either argon or diode laser. And then we proceed to early lens extraction as soon as most of the inflammation has settled. 
thank you very much for your time. And I very much look forward uh, to welcoming all of you next year to the Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress, which will be a virtual meeting. So watch this space. I'll see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clement, for excellent overview. I would like now to uh, invite Professor Mizano Rahman, who is the pres president of the Bangladesh Glaucoma Society, to give a short comment on Clement's uh, presentation. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Professor Riske Frank, for giving me an opportunity to comment on presentation of uh, Professor Clement Tham. Actually, Clement Tham nicely described the facts between the lens and the iodocorneal apposition, that is the narrow angle. A uh, few things we should consider whether the pupil is blocked or not, whether the lens is characters or not, whether the uh, thickness of the lens is more, whether the arido uh, lenticular contact is more or not. All these things should be considered to manage this type of case. And regarding the management, there are many options. We can do LPI, we can do ALPI, we can do FACO emulsification, that is lens extraction, whatever may be the position of opacity. And we can do FACO emulsification and trabeculectomy. These are the options we have. Regarding LPI, I think we should put PILO. If the PILO is effective and if the people is constricted and if the angle is free and, and if the IOP is controlled, then LPI can be effective. Without people block, Iridocorneal irido contact, we need ALPI. That is the best option in Plato Iris syndrome. But in my personal experience, in most of the cases in our region, we need to do combined procedure. Combined procedure, if the intraocular pressure is more, whether cataract present or not, clear lens extraction and trap. This is uh, most common option. Second option, if the IOP is not too much and the mild cataract is present, only phacoemulsification can relieve this iridocorneal contact and reduce the postoperative IOP. So I think Clement Tham nicely described everything that is helpful for everybody. And I must thank Clement Tham for his nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you. Professor Raman, for your Th caring. Thank you, Professor Mizan Rahman. And I'd like to thank Professor Clement Tham for one thing. When the Eagle study was published, we all of us were afraid to do clear lens extraction. But when you came to Bangladesh in Cox's Bazaar in our meeting, and you said that no problem, you can do the clear lens extraction. After that, we are doing it randomly. So actually we depend most of your experience than the Eagle study. Thank you so much. Now I think our last presenter, but not the least, our great presenter, Preen Rosano Pongthun, he is the immediate past president of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society. And he is the consultant, Bamdun Gad International and Sukhumbit Hospital Eye Care Center in Bangkok. He is also the director of Eye Center, Med Park Hospital, Bangkok. Dr. Apreen is also associate professor and chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology, Chulalongkorn University Hospital. <laughs> he is going to talk on a very good subject. I have not heard this name that trabeculectomy overhauling. So I think what overhaul he does, let us see. Welcome, Preen Rosanna Pongpun, to your speak. I'm stopping share. Dr. Preen, please. Okay. Uh, let me share my uh, slides. Okay. Does it go? Hmm. It's visible, it's visible. Go to slide presentation. I do. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. Do you see, do you see slide? Y yes, yes. Oh, okay. So, so you all see slide now. Um, thank you, uh, 
Professor Nasru, uh, Islam for the invitation uh, and to Bangladesh uh, Gokuma uh, Society. And also the, uh, I'm glad to be part of this Asia Pacific Gokuma Society uh, uh, webinars with the rest of us. Uh, I, I just stepped down from the chairman of the department and, and uh, so, so that's, uh, that's immediate past. So my topic will be filtering surgery overhauling. I don't believe anyone have heard about this. Uh, so it be, I'm excited about this too. This is my financial interest, which is nothing to related to my talk. Although some of the product will be mentioned, but it's, uh, I have no financial interest. Overhauling means taking apart in order to repair. So we need to understand what filtering surgery is. And when we look at the mechanic of filtering surgery, you will see that there will be connect aqueous to subconjunctal space. And we need a conjunctiva, we need less scarring, and we need it to be sustained that it can be taken up by the venous or the lymphatic system. So this is the mechanism of filtering surgery. Uh, we drive the aqueous through fistula and hopefully we will form a very good blep and that blep that uh, housing the aqueous will be the aqueous will be taken up by the venous or lymphatic system. So no matter how we connect this, either by a classic tabeclectomy that we do sacrectomy and iridectomy on the right hand corner, or we do the sand implant uh, that we part of the mixed surgery from subcontinual drainage, or we do the micro stand like the uh, express shunt on the left corner. It's all connect aqueous to subcontinual space, but most commonly is the tabeclectomy. But we know that tabeclectomy has shortcomings, unpredictable result, breath related problems, and also compromised vision, which could lead to cataract, hypotony, macalopathies, and other things. So unlike FAGO emulsification, in FAGO, when we discuss surgery with the patient, we can, you know, crowdies and we can uh, very confident offer the surgery because it's always the first choice surgery for cataract. It's offer better vision, low complication, quick and easy, and it's, simple post-op care. But our filtering surgery does not offer that. Instead, it offers poor vision, high complication, time and skill needed. And, and we have difficulty train over trainee to do filtering surgery nowadays because you know no one really wants to do that. And complex post-op care, we have to understand it is quite laborious. We need to see some of the patients so often and also have to manage needling, massage and other things, injection, and usually after all the medication fail. So it's not popular. And we see this fail filling surgery and we try, we ask ourselves why this happened. And we understand that in the training center that most of our patients will have so many medication that bombard the conjunctiva. So that our conjunctiva is not good. And in Asian eye, especially, we have a prone to have an excessive fibroblastic participation, which is known by our plastic surgeon. And in also the Asian eyes also have high risk of scarring compared to Caucasian. So we work in a difficult situation. That's why the tapeclectomy trend is going down after the introduction of prostaglandin. But, you know, and there are so many alternatives that tobacco under attacks and you have heard some of the mixed surgeries and even you know try not to do filtering surgery but just doing removing the lens and 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 you see some of that could leading to a complication so people try to avoid that uh, with the introduction of several filtering surgery by morphine group by pain call uh, the uh, trap catch up but one of the reason because Mix cannot offer that low IOP. So why bothering doing filtering surgery? Because the clinical trial has shown that IOP reduction can prevent long-term progression of glaucoma. And in many cases, this can only be achieved with filtering surgery only. So we need a more predictable surgery because we still have to do this surgery. And the key lies in control of aggressive flow and wound healing. So if we win this tool, 
component. If we can control the aqueous flow, we can control the wound healing. I think we are the winner in the filtering surgery. Looking at the control of aqueous flow, if we have high flow or low flow, if high flow will lead to hypotony, overflow, low flow, finally it will fail. So we need something in between that can control the flow. And perhaps we need something like control hypotony in the beginning that will allow us to have a big reservoir of aqueous that will be taken up by venous or lymphatic system. Looking at the control flow, how to achieve control flow? We need standardized lumen. We need flow restriction. We need something that always pay attention it will not block. And for control hypotony, maybe we need something that will allow us to achieve or get to the low IOP, but never lost anterior chamber, no maculopathies and less post-op intervention. So the younger people will be more happy to do this filtering surgery instead of just offering a vago or going to refractive surgery and even retinal surgeon uh, just injecting anti-worship. But uh, what hypotony mean? We all understand that hypotony is less than six millimeter IOP or with uh, vision reduced by two line. But how about control hypotony, which the IOP just temporarily less than six millimeter with just temporarily reduced vision. And finally we get a better vision. For example, this is a female, a woman who have uh, 73 years old uh, who had uh, been diagnosed of terrigium at cataract in the year 2005. She has excision of terrigium with graft, and then later on uh, uh, have FAGO done, IOP rise up, even with uh, so many medication, uh, and, and she admits is poor compliance. So we discuss about fearing surgery. This is not easy case, and her IOP is starting at 20. And in this case, I'm going to show you because it's a good a sample of, of my mini surgery because uh, the IOP can be controlled at six to nine. And the blep is like this, more diffuse blep and the A is a big blep and it look very healthy conjunctiva without permanent visual loss. This is the blep. So this is her profile. You see that early post-op in about five weeks post-op, we see hypotony at three, five, four. No problem because AC is still formed. And later on, even at five, more than five years for up, her pressure IOP is still at six millimeter of mercury. How do we achieve this? I think we achieve this because it's the early hypotony, which is just mimic what we did with the full thickness surgery in the past, but, but with a better control. Is hypotony a problem based on the consensus? If IOP itself, low IOP itself should not necessarily be considered as a complication or criteria for failure. If low IOP does not lead to maculopathies. So we need to make sure that we can mimic low IOP, control hypotony without those maculopathies, choroidal effusions and worse vision. In the, so improve trust, to improve outcome of field during surgery, we have to have a control continuous flow. We need to have less complication and this cannot be achieved. This balance cannot be achieved without that change the thing we do. So we need a big change in our field during surgery. And that is important because we know that 80 million pe people in the world will have glaucoma and a significant number of those people will need surgery. So we need a better way to connect we need a more standard nice way. And we know that Asian breaths fail more. So we need some pharmacology, like we all employ mitomycin C in our surgery and have that been Cochrane review have been shown that it's beneficial. And mitomycin C is so potent in various phases of wound healings. And, but, you know, it improves our come, outcomes of surgery. But mitomycin C can also create problems like this blep that's uh, you know, migrating into the cornea and can lead to blep dysesthesia and also the ischemic blep can lead to uh, infection. 
So we need to change the way we apply mitomycin C. And over the past, I think I think my filtering surgery is more exciting because this is something I think I learned over the past decades that we apply mitomycin C in a very large area, try to create a big reservoir at the back of the uh, conjunctival tenon complex. And the, this is the uh, sponge, you can use motor cells, you can use other sponges that not easily break. You need to know the length of the sponge, how many pieces has to be cut, your and your nurse need to be checked that. So you see that instead of applying a very small pieces of mitomycin C, this is not the case, this is a big piece, a multiple pieces of mitomycin C, and this is still in the same case. So the next piece go, the subsequent one, go on the scurry surface and just try to go back there. So it will also offer a soft dissection of the conjunctival tenon complex and then remove that. Uh, in creating the flap, the flap is big because we need to drive the fluid to the back of the eye instead of in the front of the eye. And I normally close the front of the uh, scurry flap and the conjunctival one quite tightly because I need to push all the acres back to the back of the eye to create a very healthy blep, a uh, non ischemic blep. So this is how I normally create my blebs. You know, this is just one example that we need to change the way we do surgery to get the try to win that and to get the control uh, standardized drain. Maybe we have to consider some of the chun or any devices that always patent and will give us a standardized control flow. So um, when we look at the mechanics of uh, a better drainage again, we want our filtering surgery to sustain. And I think this is just one of the strategies which I call it as a control hypotony, control over drainage to win the game. So uh, the blood become more preferable, the fields localized in the back and, and not too avascular, no cystic blood appearance in the front and little alteration to the conjunctive tidal structure. And so we move the front blood to the back and the blood has been relocated to the back of the eye. So in summary, uh, filtering surgery overhauling is mean that we need to change, we need to do something. Without changing the filtering procedure, the IOP outcome will still be poor in long term. And we know that if we want to put the IOP to be too low, the visual outcome could be com compromised with complication and HNIs are prone to, uh, has greater propensity of scarring anyway. So we have to consider pharmacologic intervention as well. Control hypotony as I present, could be one of the strategy to win the game. And uh, we create a small and self-resolving -resolve, complication and then enhance surgical technology, use of device, advanced pharmacological intervention, uh, complementing with uh, an active intervention, surgical technique modification, wound healing modification, and better conjunctival health will further improve our outcome. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Preen. It was really amazing presentation and overhauling. But I want to ask one question. I cannot ask myself. There's so many uh, uh, MMC uh, you have given forms, you have given so many. So don't you forget to bring it out? Yeah, so you, have many, to count, uh, you have to count the numbers and you have to know the length yeah. of that MMC. But this is a very new thing that you have so many. I have modified a lot. Of course, tabuclectomy is being modified from its inception from Cairns. Now we have to do the let so that our tabuclectomy becomes really a functional, really a good one. Thank you very much. Now I request Dr. Selvin Singh to have a brief comment on Prince presentation. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank the Bangladesh Kokomo Society for your very kind invitation to participate in this webinar. And I'm always impressed by the enthusiasm of your doctors and by your insights. And I would also like to thank Professor Prin for his uh, very interesting and um, excellent talk on filtering surgery overhauling. And I absolutely agree that we need more predictability in our glaucoma surgeries. 
And with the mixed devices, such as the pressure flow micro shunt, we can avoid early hypotony by controlling the length and the internal lumen diameter of the devices. But the long-term outcomes can still be very unpredictable. And a lot of this unpredictability also stems from the different propensities of our patients in terms of scarring. So we can perform exactly the same surgery in 100 patients, but their outcomes can be different in all of them because different patients scar differently. And there's still so much we need to understand and advance in terms of wound healing modulation. And perhaps the holy grail would be draining aqueous to an area that does not scar. For example, there's the Solivio implant, which drains aqueous externally with a filter that supposedly prevents anophthalmitis. But certainly, potential infection is a major consideration in such devices. So let's watch this space, and hopefully, with the advances of science and technology, glaucoma surgeons can finally achieve as predictable outcomes as cataract surgeons in the future. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll go to the last comment by Dr. Fang. But before that, would you allow me a lot of questions come from Facebook and YouTube also. So one question to Dr. Kiho Park. Uh, question is that you have shown the GCI IPL, GCI ganglion cell IPL complex layer is essential for the prognosis and diagnosis of glauco early glaucoma. Is it essential for the advanced glaucoma? Now one question. Oh, thank you very much for the great question. Um, GCIPL is very useful for detect early uh, change, especially in normal change of glaucoma. And also, it is very useful for advanced glaucoma as well, because compared to the RNF, RNFL thickness, uh, GCIPL um, has um, less um, floor effect. So um, there is a report um, uh, from Korea that uh, GCIPL is also useful for um, progression detection in advanced glaucoma as well. Thank you. You have another question that OCT angiogram, is it helpful for glaucoma imaging diagnosis and prognosis? OCT angiogram. Uh, OCT angiography is nowadays, it is, getting more and more um, um, informative to um, our um, <clears throat> glaucoma patient diagnosis. But it is, uh, I think it is in the um, early stage um, compared to the RNFL thickness and GCIPL thickness. I think in near future, um, G, um, OCT and geography may help uh, which portion of the optic nerve, which portion of the peripapillary area, and also which portion around the macula is more susceptible um, for damage. And also uh, it is a predictor of future glaucoma progression. But still now, um, our, uh, the reports on the OCT and geography is, it, it's the early stage. So we may, we may, wait for other reports. Thank you, Professor Park. I think, uh, let me allow another question for uh, Shivlan Jiang. There are many, many questions, but Shivlan Jiang, one question for you, that for the artificial intelligence, a very interesting uh, presentation. So in your experience, in your research group, the diagnosis by AI and human examination, what is the difference between sensitivity and specificity? of the AI and human examination. Dr. Zhang, do you got my question? <laughs> what is you, the difference between AI and human examination in your, exa in your research group? Okay, okay, thank you so, so much for your, for your questions. Actually, for so far for the glaucoma field AI study, uh, you can see the uh, all of the paper published uh, really show that the um, their, 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 their algorithm is, is out of form the osmologies, not only my, my study, also in their study, you can see in the published data. For my study, they're based on visual field, that one, and we, we're doing the multi-center study to uh, verify the efficacy 
uh, with the six osmologies, and we can find that the the CNN is is a uh, the result has a better performance than the six osmologies, including three is a uh, a visiting uh, doctor and three is a is a professor of, of, of glaucoma. So so there's a good result. But I don't think that single module tags uh, for the AI is not enough because we get the AOC is only uh, 0 0.87. And now we are doing combine uh, the OCT and then we get the better performance is a 0 0.9 nine uh, nine four three so in the future we need to do more uh yes. multi-module okay. text uh mm -hmm. visual view combine mm -hmm. oct combine the uh, founders photo so we are doing the project right now so hopefully we Thank can you. get better this uh diagnostic performance and Thank you. performance for the glaucoma diagnosis Thank, Thank you doctor Xu Zhang. And now I will request Dr. Fang to conclude the session. Before that, on behalf of Bangladesh Glaucoma oh, Society, yeah. I like to thank oh, and we are grateful right. to all the APGS board and speakers and panelists for coming to the BGS conference. Now, Professor Fang, will you conclude the session with your remarks? Professor Fang, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nazro. Uh, there's a request from uh, Clement for us to take a photo. Maybe you can take a group photo. Yeah. And I, I, at the same time, I would just like to thank uh, the Bangladesh uh, Glaucoma Society, Professor Mizanu Rahman, Professor Nazrul Islam, and also Ashraful for helping in the techni technical uh, issue. So now uh, I would just like to share a screen on uh, our <coughs> next uh, webinar which is uh, the Asia-Pacific Glaucoma Society uh, webinar in combination with the uh, ISGS. Uh, join us uh, on 6th of February, and uh, we'll be talking on current paradigms in glaucoma surgery. And there'll be many uh, international speakers uh, as well as APGS uh, speakers in this uh, symposium as well. Sorry for taking up uh, uh, extra minutes of your time. I would like to thank every all the speakers in and hope that we can meet face to face soon uh, in the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Clement, Selvin, Park, Preen, Zhang. Thank you very much. Tin Tin sent his apologies because he has to leave earlier. Yeah, no problem. He he wrote it before that he will go half an hour before. Thank you very much. And for the next session, we are sorry we have taken only one two minutes. We apologize for that. We can start the next session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Professor Thank Nazarul you. Islam, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, dear Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society panelists. So and we are leaving now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, bye -bye. a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Thank Merry you. Christmas. Yes. Happy New Thank Year. You. And stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.